and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. In almost every school system in the world, young people are taught about the big mystery, how the world came to be. And almost everywhere the story is the same. The teacher says, slowly, during millions and millions of years, everything came to be by chance. Evolution did it. Enormous amounts of time and chance made it all happen. Some teachers, though, teach a different story as well. They still regard creation by an intelligent outside being, which they call God, a scientific possibility. In these programs, you will meet a brilliant British scholar, Professor Arthur Wilder Smith, one of the few scientists in the world to have earned three doctor's degrees. He has published over 60 books and scientific articles, both in the field of the creation versus evolution debate as well as in his own field of science, biochemistry. Professor Wilder Smith has lived in Switzerland for many years and is one of Europe's most outstanding authorities on the creation-evolution controversy. Let's take a new look at the world around us. Let's go to Switzerland with Professor Wilder Smith and other highly qualified scientists and examine the evidence, the facts of nature. Now, there are two main models which are used to explain the origin of the cosmos, of the solar system, of the elements, and of biology right up to man. The first model which is used is known as the creation model and teaches that um, the elements and man and all biology were made by the concept of God and that he did it in quite a short time, and it means that the Earth is relatively young. That's the creation model. The second model is known as the evolutionary model and assumes that the elements, um, cosmos, and biology, and man developed over millions and millions of years, slowly, spontaneously, by chance, and that this evolutionary principle is the principle behind the elements and biology in toto. Now that's known as the evolutionary model. Now we're going in this series of films to look into these two models and see which model the evidence fits best. But before we delve deeper into the scientific information that relates to our subject, we should look at what our forefathers thought about the way things began. Very early in human history, mankind must have been very impressed with the sun, moon, and stars. Professor Wilder Smith says, Man is fundamentally religious, and if he gets a chance to see something on which he can pin his religious faith, he will. And in early days, mankind looking at the stars and the moon, and perhaps not understanding them, did come to the conclusion that they were forms of gods. 
While in Mesopotamia, the moon and stars became objects of adoration, in Egypt, the sun was dominant and worshipped as a god. To the Egyptians, he was king of the gods and ruler of the world. They believed that every day, Ra, the sun, overcame the chaos of darkness and rose triumphantly out of the primeval ocean, steering his sunboat across the heavens until he disappeared, illuminating the underworld by night. A well-known ancient hymn to the Egyptian sun god, Aten, is housed in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. It speaks of the sun as the source of all life. Thou living sun, originator of life, thou art radiant, magnificent, sparkling and high above all the lands. Thou who causes the fruit in woman, who creates the seed in man, and who grants life in the child of its mother's womb. Quite a different story is told by the Bible, the book of another ancient people in the Middle East, the people of Israel. The Bible says there is but one God, creator of heaven and earth, and thus also creator of the sun. God is the source of light and life, and sun, moon, and stars are only light bearers and markers of time and seasons. The description of the Bible is completely different from all the other stories on how the world came to be. And as many modern scientists believe, it is historically completely reliable. It's a sober account of how this beautiful world came to be. The Old Testament compares the number of the stars to the number of grains of sand on the seashores. The amazing thing is that these words were written at a time when ancient astronomers thought they knew almost exactly how many stars there were, only a few thousand. That was all they could see with the naked eye. How could the biblical writers have known that the stars were literally innumerable? Thousands of years before Galileo turned his first astronomical telescope toward the sky in 1609. Galileo was dumbfounded at what he saw. No man could even begin to give an accurate estimate of the number of stars in the universe. And yet, thousands of years before, the Bible indicated that the universe was literally too vast to be comprehended by the mind of man. To us, living in the 20th century, the sun is an important source of energy, the energy we so desperately need. Yet in our evolution theory, like the old Egyptians, we also make the sun the originator of life. And like the old Babylonians, many believe that the position of the stars can determine their future. Astrology and horoscopes play an increasing role in the lives of many and have gained an importance as more and more horoscopes are influencing men and women today. Are we then more advanced, more sophisticated than the old civilizations? In our 20th century, science and technology dominate our lives. We have explored the incredible vastness of space that surrounds us. We landed on the moon and placed observation posts on Mars. Even though space research has barely scratched the surface, our knowledge has rapidly increased over the past few years. But the more we know and discover, the more urgent the answer becomes to the questions, how did it all happen? Where do we come from? Are we a product of an intelligent creator? Or is evolution, mere chance, our real father? The common objection to the creation model is that it's supposedly not scientific. They say if you propose a god to explain the origin of energy, matter, and life, you're proposing something which you can't examine in the laboratory. Well, we can't examine God in the laboratory, that's quite true. But the creation model, although we can't examine God, can be examined in the laboratory and has proved itself to be correct. 
because if man takes the place of a creator, he can, or probably will, make certain forms of simple life in the course of the next years possible. Now, the second model, the evolutionary model, says that it's not necessary to suppose anything outside matter and energy to produce life. Uh, now, that proposition is unscientific. We know perfectly well that if you leave matter to itself, that it doesn't organize itself, in spite of all the efforts to prove that it does in recent years. Um, what we do need every time in order to get life is to inject information into matter from an intelligent being, be God or man. So the second model doesn't fit in with the scientific facts as we know them, as well as the first model, the creation model, does. Why is Professor Wilder Smith so sure that evolution could never have taken place? The answer is quite simple. Let's take the example of the skyscrapers of New York City. To make these huge buildings, you need a plan. Architects and engineers made complicated calculations to construct them in such a way that people can safely live and work in them. Of course, no one has the illusion that these skyscrapers will last for eternity. Everything in nature is obedient to its immutable laws. The second law of thermodynamics says that eventually everything falls apart and disintegrates. Nothing is eternal. Everything changes and chaos increases. This does not only account for things we make, but also for nature itself. The chemical processes which sustain the life of our bodies become less efficient as we grow older. We're all familiar with this universal law. A watch winds down. A car rusts out. Left to themselves, all chemical compounds tend to break apart into simpler materials, rather than to become more complex. For the well-known evolutionist Isaac Asimov, this problem of increasing chaos has been the inspiration for a science fiction story. Writing most of his 200 scientific and science fiction books from New York, Asimov tells why eventually everything in nature regresses into chaos. The second law of thermodynamics states that the amount of available work you can get out of the energy of the universe is constantly decreasing. If you have a great deal of energy in one place, a large intensity of it, so that you have a high temperature here and a low temperature there, then you can get work out of that situation. The smaller the difference in temperature, the less work you can get out of it. Now, according to the second law of thermodynamics, there is always a tendency for the hot areas to cool off and the cool areas to warm up so that less and less work can be obtained out of it until finally, when everything is one temperature, you can't get any work out of it, even though all the energy is still there. And this is true for everything in general, the universe all over. In other words, Water flows down, not up. Water seeks its level. It doesn't separate. Uh, things become disorderly. Uh, there is an expression, entropy, which can be best defined by certain mathematical expressions. And this is the way theoretical physicists do define it. But if we forget the mathematics, what the entropy is, is a measure of the level of disorder in the universe. The greater the disorder, the greater the entropy. It is a measure of the evening out of everything in the universe. The more everything in the universe evens out, the greater the entropy. Eventually, if the universe lasts long enough, it would seem that entropy reaches a maximum. Everything evens out, everything is completely disorderly, and there can be no further change after that, no work done, nothing. It's a kind of death. Scientists know of no exception to this law. And although Dr. Asimov does not personally recognize it as such, many scientists believe 
This is a very real and serious obstacle for the theory of evolution. For evolution requires that the atoms organize themselves into more and more complex, ordered arrangements. Evolution states that over millions of years, everything is basically developing upward, becoming more orderly and complex. However, this basic law of science, the second law of thermodynamics, says the exact opposite. Complex, ordered arrangements actually tend to become simpler and more disorderly with time. There is an irreversible downward trend throughout the universe. A number of scientists have pointed out that this law alone, when truly understood, is enough to refute the theory of evolution. In fact, it is one of the most important reasons why a number of evolutionists have dropped their theory in favor of the idea of an original creation. For our solar system alone, there are at least 23 different evolutionary theories for its origin. Why so many? Because none of them fit the data. None of them except the idea that it looks like it was designed. The universe does not seem to have the form of something which had been formed simply by an explosion and random accidents. The universe operates according to precise laws and functions in an orderly way. The more we explore, the more we find orderly patterns and systems. Did all this happen by accident? If we look into the past, of the universe, we find that the entropy has been decreasing. And that means that the, the unevenness of energy has been increasing. In the past, more energy was accumulated in one spot and not in another. Until finally, if we go back far enough, we find that entropy was a minimum. And then everything is as orderly as possible. And the way it looks now, that was the time when all the matter in the universe was in one big ball and just arranged everything in rank and file, so to speak, like soldiers at parade. And then it exploded, the Big Bang, 15 billion years ago. And as soon as it exploded, it became more disorderly, and the disorder has been increasing ever since. It's as though all the soldiers on parade were told to break ranks. And ever since, they've been going every which way in whatever they want, way they want, until they'll be spread out evenly over the whole Earth, at which time entropy will be at a maximum. explanation of a very complicated and highly ordered universe as we know it? The astronomer, Professor Harold Slusher. The Big Bang uh, is one of the modern-day cosmogonies trying to explain the origin of the universe and what's in it. The Big Bang maintains that all of the matter and energy in the universe was concentrated at one time in uh, what is referred to as a primordial atom or a primeval atom. The size of this atom in the opinions of different astronomers has varied. Some say it was infinite in size. Others say that it was had about the diameter of the solar system. Today, the modern views would say that the primordial atom was the size of an electron or smaller. These people maintain that all of the matter and energy was concentrated in an object smaller than, let's say, the tip of the head of a pen and that this object sat in space for who knows how long and then suddenly developed an instability in it and the thing exploded. And somehow out of it galaxies and clusters of galaxies and stars and at least one planetary system were formed. If one looks at the universe today, out of explosions, we never see order taking place. We see disorder produced. So it is a natural thing to ask, 
What is the evidence for such an idea? An idea so, uh, let's say, unlike anything we're seeing today. Something that doesn't seem to follow any common sense models that we have of anything at all. Well, the proposed evidences are the, what is referred to as the expansion of the universe. When we look at the light coming from galaxies, this light appears to be shifted to the red side. By saying that it's shifted to the red side, I mean that um, if an object is moving away from us, to the observer, it appears that, that those wavelengths of light get stretched out. And by getting stretched out, the light is shifted to the long side of the spectrum, and the light appears to be red. This is believed to be an effect caused by the motion of an object away from an observer. By the way, if an object, a star or a galaxy, were moving toward an observer, the light would be shifted to the blue side of the spectrum. But when you look out at galaxies, the light appears to be shifted to the red side for practically all of the galaxies. By the way, you should keep in your mind that some of the galaxies have blue shifts. This has never been explained on the basis of an expanding universe, but most of the galaxies have a red shift. This is believed to be evidence of an expanding universe. There are a variety of other recognized possible scientific explanations for the red shift, which do not require any explosion or expansion of the universe. For example, as predicted by Einstein, light can also be reddened by gravity, the attractive force between all matter in the universe. In addition, there are many reasons to seriously doubt the universe could have been formed by a Big Bang. Here on the Earth, in all of our experience, we never observe uh, explosions producing ordered arrangements. I'm sure you would consider it an absolutely incredible, fantastic, uh, fictional story if I told you that I saw one of these mountains explode, and out of the explosion, the rocks and the dust uh, and the gas settling to form a city, say, a rock city, in which you have a lot more order and complexity and information than you had in the mountain of rock itself. It seems to me virtually impossible to get the real universe that we see around us. Now, not some imaginary thing, but the universe that we observe, a complex one, one full of information, from a Big Bang. It seems to me only possible to get a complex universe, one with information, by the matter and energy being created, since it will not arise spontaneously from nothing, but being created, and then order put into the system and complexity put into the system, and information from the outside. So to create any kind of development or complex organization in a closed system, you need energy and information from the outside. Evolutionists maintain that our Earth isn't a closed system at all, that it is open to the sun's energy, and that the energy of the sun's rays, for instance, created the life on our beautiful planet. But is energy enough even when you have an open system? There are a number of problems with the theory of evolution, particularly from the point of view of thermodynamics. The laws of thermodynamics are three. The second law is that the amount of work available uh, for useful work in a closed system decreases. Another way of saying that is that the order or organization of matter in a closed system goes down, it descends into chaos. Now, there are exceptions, and these exceptions confuse. If you take, say, something dead, like a stick, that formerly was growing and using the sun's energy to increase its order, but it's now dead, now, if I expose that stick in to, to sunlight in, a open, in an open system, this stick will get warm. In fact, it's quite warm now because the sun is quite strong. Now, that means that its organization is decreasing. Its entropy is increasing. Now, that's in an open system. Why doesn't its organization increase? It should do, according to the law of evolution. 
the, the postulate of evolution. If I take, on the other hand, not a dead stick, but something that's living, like this nice little orchid here, early spotted uh, orchid, uh, that orchid is absorbing sun's energy just as this stick is absorbing the sun's energy. But the energy that falls on that from the sun is by coupled reactions being used to increase the order and to grow. Um, the chlorophyll does that. But if I kill this orchid, if I would pick it and let it die, the energy of the sun would fall on it, and then it would get hotter and therefore more disorganized. What's the difference then between the stick, which is dead, and the orchid, which is alive? The difference is that the orchid has active, what the scientists call, teleonomy in it. It's a machine which is capturing energy to increase order. This machine is dead and is not capturing energy to reduce uh, disorder and to increase order. There's the difference. Where did the teleonomy come from? The teleonomy, the ordering principle, does not reside in matter itself, but it does reside in life. And where you have life, you have teleonomy, and then the sun's energy can be taken and make the thing grow, that is, increase its order. I, as a scientist, must therefore postulate a source of information to supply the teleonomy or know-how. I don't find it in this universe, and therefore I assume that it's transcendent to this universe, and I believe myself in a living God who did it. I believe that this God who supplied the information, revealed himself in the form of a man so that man could understand him. We're made to understand, we're homo sapiens, and if God made us to understand, I want to understand, and I want to understand God. But I can only do it if he comes down to my wavelength, which is the wavelength of man. And therefore I believe that God uh, revealed himself in the form of Christ, and that we can serve him and know him in our hearts as the source of the Logos, all information necessary to make the universe and to make life itself. <laughs>